This is the story of how three legendary motocross world champions inadvertently changed the sport forever. This is the story of the original two-stroke killer. This is the story of the infamous Yamaha HL500. And in this video, not only will we learn its story, but we'll also get to see it in action as well. Was this the bike that truly set the stage for the four-stroke revolution? That's what we will attempt to answer in this video. But one thing I know for sure is that you just wouldn't see something like this take place in the sport today. This is the ultimate underdog story. early days of Grand Prix motocross were dominated by British built four-stroke machines. BSA were the powerhouse brand of the day, but their reign as kings of the sport was brought to an end by a Scandinavian invasion led by the Swedes and Husqvarna. These Vikings came over aboard their small, lightweight two-stroke machines and took the motocross world by storm. Names such as Torsten Hallman, Bent Aigberg, Sten Lundin and Rolf Tiblin etched their names into the annals of motocross history during this time. The age of the thumper was over. It was time for the two-stroke to reign supreme. By the time the Japanese decided to embark on their own invasion of the dirt bike world in the early 1970s, memories of those British built four strokes and their former dominance were fading into the mists of time. It's hard to imagine nowadays, but back then, two stroke technology was just seen as being so much more effective for off road use. In fact, up until 1970, all 172 dirt bike models produced by Yamaha were two-stroke powered machines. In the wider world of motorcycles though, the tide had begun to turn once again. Even as early as the 1970s, environmental and emission concerns in the booming US dual sport market led manufacturers to head back down the four-stroke path for their desert and trail bike machines. Regardless of that, Two smokers remained the real kings of true off-road riding. But in the 1970s, Yamaha were well aware that the EPA were aiming to outlaw all road-going two-strokes by the end of the decade. So, in response, in 1975, Yamaha unveiled their first four-stroke powered trail bike, the XT500. There was also the TT500, which was the stripped down, pure off-road version of the XT500. Both of the machines were designed specifically for the US market and were to be sold there exclusively. And the general public loved the XT500. It was said to be everything the old British thumpers should have been. It had loads of torque with a silky smooth power delivery that made it very easy to ride which was very much the opposite of the big bore two smokers of the same era. However, the XT500 wasn't supposed to be too happy at high speeds, and obviously the suspension was lacking also. And although the TT500 was supposed to be the off-road specific version of the bike, the machine just wasn't up to handling serious trails, let alone the motocross track. At 300 pounds, it was just too heavy, too slow, and the suspension just wasn't competent enough. Despite the limitations of the machine as a whole, the effectiveness, efficiency, and usability of that XT500 motor did turn some heads and set imaginations running wild inside the minds of two very influential motocross champions. Having raced Grand Prix motocross from 1959 through to 1971, and collecting four 250cc motocross world championships along the way, Torsten Hallman was one of the most revered and well-respected names in the sport in 1975. After his retirement from racing in 1971, Hallman was hired by Yamaha to help develop their YZ race machines. 
and at the start of 1975, Torsten heard about the soon-to-be-released XT500, which was ready to be unveiled to the US market. Hallman soon began brewing the idea of using this new four-stroke platform and developing a race-ready competition version. He approached the Japanese with the concept, but they weren't keen on the idea, given the fact that the XT500 wasn't to be available to buy in Europe. So they straight up refused to give Hallman a bike or even a motor that he could use to develop his concept. Luckily for Hallman and his four-stroke dream, that year's ISDT was to be held in Europe, on the Isle of Man in fact, and rumour had it that American racer Gary Serdyke had brought over a prototype XT500 to use in the event. Serdyke didn't have the best of times with his machine expiring on the third day of competition. But as the legend goes, Torsten Hallman tracked down Mr. Serdyke on the island and purchased the XT500 off of the American right there and then. And just like that, in October 1975, Torsten Hallman owned the only XT500 in Europe. Like I say, that's how the legend goes. But in order to verify those stories, I have actually been in contact with Mr. Hallman himself but we'll hear from the four-time world champion a little later in our story. Once Torsten had sourced an XT500, he took the bike back to Sweden where he worked closely with his compatriot Sten Lundin. At this time, Sten was the service manager for Yamaha Sweden, but he too was a former world champion, having won the 500cc world championship in 1959 for Monarch and then again in 1961. Knowing that the engine was a good workhorse, the pair initially focused on sorting out the frame and the chassis. To begin with, the motor was slotted into a much lighter Husqvarna frame, and then that was used as a basis to create a totally original frame for the project. London drew up the final frame design, and it was manufactured in California by a company called Profab. They also fabricated a special aluminium swinging arm and swapped out the stock Kayaba shocks, first with Fox shocks from the US, before finally deciding on using a new Swedish company called Olins to supply the shocks. Obviously, Hallman and Lunden had access to copious amounts of Yamaha spare parts, so a lot of the original XT componentry was swapped out for YZ motocross parts, such as the forks, the wheels, the hubs, the brakes, and so on. The main aim of the game here was to reduce weight as much as possible, and they were very successful in doing that. When they were done, the bike weighed 225 pounds, which was a massive 55 pound weight loss over the TT500, which itself was supposed to be the lightweight version of the XT500. Torsten and Sten were well on their way to creating a mean race machine, but they knew they needed a bump in power if they were going to be truly competitive. Clutch plates were replaced with those from a YZ250 and the ignition from a YZ125 saved 1.5 kilograms alone. The crankshaft and gearbox on the XT were left untouched, but the cylinder head and piston were altered to give a 11 to 1 compression over the standard 9 to 1 compression of the XT. The 34mm Mycuni carb was replaced with a 36mm version. After all was said and done, this finished race bike was said to have gained 20 ponies, going from 30 horsepower to 50 horsepower. Hallman and London had done it. They had created a true race-ready four-stroke machine worthy of taking on the two smokers. The Hallman London 500 was born and it was ready to take on the world. They just needed a pilot willing and able to take their creation to the top. By the end of 1976, London and Hallman had realised the true extent of their achievements. They hadn't just reworked an XT500, they had created a true race machine. They believed that they had a bike ready to take on the 500cc World Championships, and that's exactly what they set out to do. 
Apparently the Yamaha factory race team weren't too keen on the idea whatsoever. But Hallman went over their heads and straight to the Yamaha Europe HQ in Amsterdam. He arrived with a plan and some carefully calculated costs. He asked for a $15,000 budget to set up a small team to compete in the 1977 500cc World Championships. And although initially hesitant, Yamaha eventually gave the green light to the Swedish legend to go ahead and prove the world wrong. After all, they had just made a U-turn on their US only distribution. So an XT based machine racing in the Grand Prix would be great marketing for the arrival of the XT500 in Europe. The legend of Hallman's meeting with Yamaha goes on to say that in order to get the deal over the line, the four time world champion made the bold or brash promise or prediction that the HL500 would in fact finish inside of the top five at least once during the season. But once again, we'll get the lowdown on whether that actually happened when we catch up with Torsten. Hallman and Lunden were able to hire a veteran Swedish racer and the third and final world champion in our story, Bengt Aberg, to race their bike through the 1977 Grand Prix campaign. Having won the 500cc world championship in 1969 and 1970 for Husqvarna, Aberg was more than qualified to lead the charge in what Hallman hoped would be the four-stroke revolution. The HL500 is also referred to and widely known as the Aberg Yamaha. It was a steep learning curve for this small team of four-stroke enthusiasts. A string of bike problems and punctures throughout the early part of the season dampened spirits somewhat inside of the HL camp. But Aberg had shown good promise on board the machine. And with a bit of lady luck on their side, that promise came to fruition at the German GP, where Aberg was able to clinch a third place in the first moto. That result meant that Hallman was able to keep his promise to Yamaha, and it was only the midpoint of the season. Aberg managed another third place ride at the British GP after a torrid time in North America for the US and Canadian Grand Prix. Luck definitely hadn't been on their side much throughout the season, but all of the hard work and heartache was about to be rewarded at the penultimate round of the year in Luxembourg. Once the gates dropped for Moto1, Aberg was embroiled in an epic battle with the Montessa mounted Hacken Anderson. As the race continued, Anderson faded backwards and Aberg dropped the Montessa man. The HL500 was all alone and on top of the world. Unchallenged, Aberg brought it home ahead of Anderson and Heike Mikkola. He crossed the finish line to take the first Grand Prix Moto win for a four stroke in eight years. Bengt didn't get such a hot start in the second race of the day and had to fight through the pack to eventually finish in third position. At the end of the day, Aberg tied on points with Heike Mikkola and the overall GP was given to Heike as he had won the tiebreaker. Nevertheless, this was a grand achievement for Aberg and his small team. They had seemingly achieved the impossible and at the time, this result was considered to be a truly historical event. When all was said and done, Bengt Aberg finished ninth overall in the 1977 500cc World Championship. He was the second highest placed Yamaha rider, only behind Heike Mikkola, who went on to win the championship that year. This book right here, Yamaha Dirt Bikes, has been a massive help in my research for this video. And I just wanted to share a line from the book that I thought was very interesting and highly amusing. In regards to that moto win in Luxembourg, the author Colin McCalla writes, this was the first GP moto win by a four stroke for eight years and probably the last ever. L little did he know, hey, little did anyone know back then what was to come around the corner in the moto world. Whether it's an old bike or a new bike, a two stroke or a four stroke, we always use the best stuff in our machines and you guys should too. In terms of oils, lubricants, cleaner products and everything else like that, we use Pewterline and specifically Pewterline MX-9 two stroke oil for our two stroke machines. So be sure to check out Pewterline, there's links and more information in the description down below. Support the brands that support us and we can continue to bring you bigger and better videos each and every week.
Thanks, as always, to Pewterline. Despite their successes in 1977, factory support from Yamaha for the HL500 wasn't available to Torsten and his team for the 1978 season. But encouraged by their previous triumphs, Hallman ploughed on with the project. He instructed Niels Hedlund to develop a free valve head in order to boost power for the new season. But results were lacking in 1978 and Hallman was frustrated. It's reported that he asked and he begged Yamaha for a smaller, lighter four-stroke motor, which they eventually did develop, albeit 20 years later. But at the time, they told Torsten that this wasn't going to happen. So he decided that there could be no future for a four-stroke in World Championship motocross. He pulled the plug and the team was disbanded. But that wasn't quite the end of the road for the HL500. The Aberg bikes had garnered quite a lot of attention and interest. Bengt had built a nice little fan base for the HL500 and one of those fans happened to be a manager at Yamaha Europe. He commissioned a small batch of Aberg replicas to be produced and sold across Europe. Aberg's spare race bike was sent to the Norton factory in Shepstone, England and a very, very limited amount of machines were produced in 1978. And it just so happens that my good friend Dave King has one of those bikes in his collection. So let's take a closer look at Dave's bike before we head to the track to find out how a HL500 performs and feels in the hands of a modern rider. So when I learned about the story of the Yamaha HL500, I was fascinated. And I never thought that I'd be able to see one in person, let alone one like this, Dave, that is almost brand new, do we think? Yeah. Just tell us about the bike in front of us here. So I bought this uh, probably 15 years ago, and this is the first time I've seen it for 15 years. We just dug it out of a garage. But it, yeah, it's a, this is a proper survivor. So just tell us what you know about the HL story then. Everybody saw four strokes as big, heavy things. This wasn't, this was a relatively light bike and a, and a good bike to ride. It had its faults, but it won a Grand Prix, so it can't be that bad. So those race bikes that Aberg raced in the 77 inspired these ones. They were commissioned by Absolutely. Yamaha Europe, right? And made here in England. Yep. So this is one of those bikes it's, that's made here in England. Not many, right? No, so Yamaha commissioned 200 bikes to be made for sale in 1978 and 200 Mark IIs to be sold in 1979. And which year is this? This is a 78, this is the Mark I, based on the 1977 Grand Prix bike. So there's only 200 of these were ever made. How many do you think survive? There's, there's probably about a thousand that survived because there's so many copies. It was quite an easy bike to copy. They were all based on the same thing, but they all had their little quirks and, and flaws. They were not mass produced in Japan. They were hand built in England out of the Yamaha parts bin because all of these parts came off of different model Yamahas that were available yeah, at the just, time. Just talk us through, go from front end to the back. Just talk us through some of the parts okay. and some of the quirky bits. Front end was, on a standard bike, was Yamaha 1978 YZ400. The tank was off a YZ125C 1976. Yeah. Rear mudguard off a YZ125C the seat off a YZ125 seat. So you can see why it looks small because yeah. this part here was 125. That's why riders like riding it because it was fairly heavy down low, but on the top, it was an extremely slim bike. The side panels were handmade in fiberglass. The swing and arm was handmade in England. And the wheels were again, YZ400E 1978. So it was a real collection of yeah. collection of parts. And the, the frame itself was that Curtis, right? No, well, Brian Curtis, famous BMX frame yeah, guy, famous BMX and motocross um, 
frame builder, Brian Curtis of Froome in Somerset, England. He was working for a company that made the frames. So he did a lot of the, the welding. The bike came as a, a great package of parts, but they were expensive. And that's why they did, again, they didn't sell. Right. Just talk to me about that pipe, Dave. Yeah, so the exhaust pipe. There's no silencer, it's just straight through. And as I used to race these bikes, I, I know a lot about them. This, what I would call the bomb here. Now FMF, maybe when the full stroke thing kicked off, FMF um, patented the name, I think it was, they called it the bomb. The bomb yeah, yeah. Well, they shouldn't have done that because NVT did this in the 70s. They invented it, that's what it's there for. Straight through and exits there by your, by your boot. <laughs> loud then. It, it was extremely loud, yeah. Anybody who, who used to race these has got damage here, and me included. So you've, you've referenced it there, you talked about it. You race these, not this one. You've had a few of no, these over yeah, the years. I probably own six or seven of these bikes, the 78 and the 79. They both had their subtle differences, but they were a lovely, lovely bike to ride. So you've single-handedly owned like two or three percent of the HL 500. Possibly. Oh, I, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I probably traded many more than that yeah. over the years. So what were they like to ride? Because I'll, I'm asking this for a reason, because I am going to ride one of these. Don't know if you can tell, I'm a little bit shorter than Dave, so <laughs> they, I'm worried they, about that. Yeah, they are quite tall. They're quite a short wheelbase, so they turn very, very easily, but that means that the front end will come up on you yeah. quite easily as well. They are powerful. They're, they were great bikes. The weakness with the XT500 engine was the gearbox, third gear. Lots of hard use and that th third gear would destroy a motor. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to that, I think. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So next shot, I think I'll be in gear at the track. Or trying to start it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. How easy are they to start? Um... I never had a problem because I've got long yeah, legs. legs I've noticed your legs are substantially <laughs> shorter than mine, so you may yeah. have an issue, especially if it's muddy. Yeah, well, fingers crossed, wish me luck. So here we are, finally at the track, and we've got another fine example of a HL500 in front of us. This is a sexy looking bike and it is Kevin's bike. Kevin, tell us about this machine. How is it different to the one that we saw earlier on with Dave King and how did you come to own this? Well, this is a full replica um, built by the good lad over there. Well, frame wise. So you had a, an example of the original frame from back in from, from when they the were 70s. Built. Yeah, yeah, from when MVT were doing them. We copied that apart from the rear brake everything else is exactly the same and apart from the forks and the forks are a, li a little bit more modern forks yeah, a bit right? more modern what is it about the hl 500s that kind of like you love what entices you about these bikes because you had a few right yeah i built two of these yeah i built actually i built two for myself and i built a couple for the the drayton frame lads i just love the look of them just absolutely, I just think they're stunning. Back to the build, how easy or difficult was it to get the frame done? Obviously talk about just, the Drayton guys helped you do that, just right? Just time, just time and getting the jig made was obviously the biggest thing because it's obviously you've got to jig the frame to, to get everything exact and, and accurate. For the guys who do these frames, it, it, it's, it's, it's bread and butter, isn't it? It's straightforward stuff. So Kevin, Drayton Frames, who obviously built the frame for this machine, what else do they do? What do they usually specialise in? Their, their specialist is, is um, pre-65 trials. That's their main thing. They do anything from a Bantam Tiger Cub, 350 Triumph, and they have done a couple of um, Green Lane bikes. So essentially what we've got here, the bike we saw the other day with Dave was a genuine machine from back in the day, from the batch of 200 that was produced yeah. in Britain back then. And this one is a replica, a replica of, those, of bikes. those bikes. Yeah, yeah. but the yeah. motor's the Everything same. Everything exactly the same. Everything. So we're here at Brewery MX today. MX, yeah. I'm going to spin some laps on the HL500. See how it goes. And as a little bonus, Kevin's also somehow wrote me into a, a race or a competition on this bike in a few months. But we'll keep that under our hats for now. But just expect to see this bike back on the channel in a few months' time. For now, though. Let's go riding. <laughs> okay, so I'm riding the HL500. 
Golf 500, by far the oldest four stroke I've ever had the pleasure of having a spin on. So, like we've discussed, this technically isn't an HL500, an original build, one of the 200 that Dave King owns. It's a replica frame, a replica chassis, but for all intents and purposes, this is what it felt like to ride one of those bikes back in the day. And this is a lovely example. It does not feel like an old twin shock bumper <laughs> in terms of power delivery or whatnot. It does in terms of stopping and in the corner I'm actually right currently sat on the fuel tank. I'm not sure that's how that was ridden back in the day by Bent Aberg and the lights. So my modern rider, I just want to get right up in the corners like that and I was sitting on the fuel tank. Oh. So oh can't stop. Nearly <laughs> overshot. <laughs> so on this little kiddie track here. It's a bit wet here in England at the moment so I'm just spin around this kiddie track to get used to things. It feels pretty fast, you know. <laughs> Considering how slick the track could be, see the water laying around. This power feels very tractable, very usable. Hard on the brakes. Those uh, old whoa, drum brakes locking up the back. Oh. Got to make sure you're in the right gear, otherwise that power could be a bit snatchy like it was there. Woohoo! You know, that then is surprisingly pleasant. Which I was not expecting, expecting it to not to turn very well. Well, I say that. Dave said it would turn well because it's such a short wheelbase. And he was right. I can see, you know, I can see why Torsten and Sten and Bent thought this might be a good idea, you know. Did this, the first four-stroke to win a GP in eight years, is this really what sparked the four-stroke revolution that was to come 20 years later? Well, that's the question that we're trying to answer here. And I've been talking to the man that might have the answer. I've been talking to Torsten Holman himself. Let's see what he has to say. I've called this bike a machine that changed the sport forever. Now, I guess that probably isn't strictly true. That title should go to the YZ400, which was the first properly developed OEM four-stroke of the 1990s. That's the bike that in reality started the four-stroke revolution that still grips the sport to this day. But my thought was that this bike, the HL500 from 1978, might well have been the inspiration for what was to come 20 years later with the YZ400. Did the engineers just need that time to develop the technology? Maybe they did, and maybe they didn't. I'm interested to know what you guys think, but I'm more interested to know what four-time world champion Torsten Hallman has to say on the subject. I posed some questions to the mastermind behind this all, so let's hear what he's got to say. Hi guys, I'm Thorsten Holman, the letter H in the famous motocross model Yamaha HL500. 
It's hard to believe that the HL500 designed and built for almost 50 years ago by a small group of enthusiastic forestry people here in Sweden. That it still can attract so many motocross fans and bike builders all around the world. I know that several people are building copies right now around the world. Just a small thought, an idea. Is the HL500 the most copied bike in the world? If you look in a 50 years time frame, so many copies have been made every year during the 50 years. So I've exchanged a few emails with Torsten Holman in regards to the HL500. So I asked Torsten, first of all, where did the project, where did the idea originate? And this is what he said. When we got the specifications of a new a one cylinder 500cc engine that would be only sold in America with the model designation TT500, we immediately contacted Yamaha to order some machines. But unfortunately, we were turned down. Why was there such great interest on our part? In the first place, it was Sten Lunden, who was the biggest four-stroke enthusiast of all of us at our company. He studied the specifications and pictures carefully and was convinced that Yamaha had designed an engine that would be suitable in motocross. So the original idea came from Sten, but both myself and my partner in the company, Stefan Eichvist, were just as enthusiastic about the idea. We were convinced that with the right rider and a more modern four-stroke engine, they would be competitive. From the beginning, we hadn't even thought about entering a team of our own into the World Championship Series. In retrospect, you might think it was a shot in the dark. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to try and work out if some of these legends around the HL500 project were actually true. So I asked Torsten if the story about the Isle of Man and him tracking down the only XT500 in Europe was true. And this is what he responded. As I mentioned in the introduction, Yamaha did not want to send motorcycle models or engines that, at that time, were not planned to be marketed in Europe. However, we were lucky when my partner in Torsten Holman Racing in La Mesa, California, Lars Larsen, was visiting Sweden to prepare to ride the ISDT on the Isle of Man. I had talked to Lars about how we had failed to get the TT500 bike slash motor to Sweden. When Lars came to the six days, he met an American who was going to participate on a TT500. Lars then calls me and tells me about this. Right away I said, Lars, buy it right now. Make sure it comes to Sweden when he's done with the race. Another one of the legends that I had heard about the HL500 was how Torsten traveled to Amsterdam to convince Yamaha Europe to fund some of the project and that he promised them a top five finish would be coming that season. I asked him if that story was true and this was his answer. After the test rides had been to Bench satisfaction, and he confirmed that he would like to ride the World Championship Series with our bike, that's when the enthusiasm from my side became at least as strong as Sten's. A budget was made with what investment would cost, and we then saw that our sales would not be able to finance the team, rider, mechanic, transport, and everything that was needed to participate. I started by pitching the idea to the Scandinavian marketing manager at Yamaha. He immediately said no, no interest. I then moved on to the marketing manager for Europe, he also said no. I then went down to Yamaha's European office in Amsterdam and asked for a meeting with the top manager, Mr. Kuratomo. Of course, I could have gone down to the Amsterdam office and talked to Mr. Kuratomo directly, but then the two marketing managers would have been angry if I had walked past them with such a type of request. You can't do that in a Japanese organization. So now it was only the head of Yamaha Europe I had to convince. I did not promise that Bank would earn a place among the first five, but among the first ten. What I promised and what we discussed was that I was completely convinced of the advertising value of the venture. I promised that all motorcycle magazines in the world reporting about motocross will have pictures of Bank and his Yamaha on the front page in the coming year. I promised that all motorcycle magazines would do several technical articles about Bank and his HL500. I meant that Bank on his Yamaha with his crowd pleasing riding style will be the rider that is written the most articles about at the same time as it is mentioned that the engine comes from Yamaha's new sensational off-road model, the XT500. The budget and money needed were then the topic of discussion. 
I asked him to know that we believe in this and our company will cover half the costs. I also stated that I personally was completely convinced that it was an investment that would strengthen Yamaha's image in the off-road segment. Mr. Kuratomo needed no time to give me an answer. He said, who can say no to such a brilliant proposal? Of course we are paying for our share of this investment. I will also make sure that you get all the support you need regarding the technical side of things with us in Japan. Good luck. That answer was as cool as I hoped it would be. Next up, I asked Torsten about the end of the project and why the HL fizzled out as it did even after the success in Luxembourg. Torsten said, We saw that the HL 500 was not as fast as the two-stroke bikes. Bengt needed more horsepower for the 1978 season. For the 1978 World Championship season, we knew that Bengt Ober needed some more power in his bike to be able to compete with Mikola, the Coster and the best riders in the game. So, he contacted Nils Hedlund, the famous engine builder here in Sweden. And we said, Nils, we need some more horsepower. And in a short time, he made a three well cylinder and cylinder head for, for Bank to use for the 78th season. So here you can see some of the products which was done to produce three sets of sand casted three well cylinder heads and cylinders for Bank to use. And here you can see the fine job made to make the molds in, in, in wooden material. And here you can see it even better that it's wood. This is the intake, the three well intake. And then, of course, several other products which was made to make a successful three well cylinder head. And here you have also some of the, of, of the drawings Nils was making for the bike. So I still have everything kept in my man, man cave. Thank you for listening. Unfortunately, the extra horsepower came at a higher RPM that didn't suit Banks' riding style. He rode in a few races with the free valve engine, but more often preferred the original. As we know, in 1978, Yamaha Europe produced a very small batch of HL500 replicas. I asked Torsten what his thoughts were on these machines and whether he was pleased to see his idea and their concept being put into production. From Hallman and Eidvist Motor AB side, we were positive and helped them with the startup of production. Both Sten Lunden and his son Kenneth spent a lot of time at the factory, helping from the beginning. But unfortunately, they couldn't build a bike that even came close to how the original HL500 was built. This resulted in many disappointed customers, as the English model was not even competitive to ride veteran races with. No, not satisfied. It wasn't what we expected, unfortunately. And I have to say, I was pretty surprised to read that answer, but it was fascinating nonetheless. Next up, I asked whether Torsten thought that their work in the 1970s had any influence on what was to come later in the 1990s with the YZ400. After the 1978 season, we did not get any more financial help from Yamaha to continue to develop the HL project. We had good communication with the engine department in Japan. We sent suggestions on how we thought a completely new, smaller, narrower and lighter engine could be manufactured to be competitive. But unfortunately, they had no interest in working with the proposals that Sten Lunden had sent. But the proposals probably ended up in a drawer somewhere in the design department and looked at in the early 1990s. My final question to Torsten was simple. After 50 years, did he think that he'd still be answering questions about the Yamaha HL500? And this is what he said. No, I could not even in my wildest dreams have imagined that I would be sitting here writing about our dear HL project. I would like to point out that it was Sten Lunden who was the original source of the idea to start the project. And that we, Stefan Eichvist and myself, as the owners of the company, were also eager supporters of the project. I can take credit for being the one who worked hard to fund the project 
and at our company, Holman and Einkvist Motor, there were many HL fans as the project was very positive and created a good feeling among all employees. They felt that they were part of a company that dared to fight against the big motorcycle factories in the World Championship. It felt great. So there we go, some awesome answers from Torsten Holman there. I can't thank Torsten enough for taking the time to answer my questions and give us some awesome insight into the HL500 project. The full transcript of our Q&A will be pinned in the comments down below, you can't miss it. Torsten went into detail on some of the questions that I haven't included in the video, so it's definitely worth taking a look. Okay, so there we have it. I've spun some laps on a HL500. Color me surprised. This was a fun bike to ride. It's got that little uh, 125 fuel tank. Feels skinny at the front. Turns really nice. That short wheelbase, like Dave King said. Power-wise, it pulls. Tractable little track like this. I'm not really getting up to speed to show really show me what it's truly capable of but like i mentioned earlier we might get to see that in a, a few weeks time a couple of months time what a cool bike what a privilege we had to ride something like this big thanks to kevin big thanks to dave king everyone that's made this video possible my name's max you've been watching 999 laser till next time i'll see you at the track so after Torsten's comments, I'm now properly curious to find out what the actual HL500 race bikes were like to ride. Maybe one day, we can find out.